I'd like to introduce the candidates for the 46th Ward Aldermanic Race. We'll begin with opening statements. Mr. Kappelman has won the toss, and you may begin. You have three minutes. Thank you. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event, and of course, Peace, People's Church for hosting this. Uh, first off, I delivered on the things that you asked me to do back in 2011. You asked for a new Wilson L station. I delivered a $200 million rehab, a, a total overhaul of that station. You wanted economic development. We have an unprecedented amount of economic development happening in the 46th Ward. We're averaging one new business a month. That has never happened before. I've established targeted task forces to address chronic crime in some of the hotspots of this ward, where for the first time ever, we have the police, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, the local businesses, the social services, and most of all, the residents working together to take back our streets. I know it's working, and that's why I'm so proud to have the endorsement of Anita Alvarez, our Cook County State's Attorney, and the Chicago Police uh, Sergeants Association. I focused on holding landlords accountable for the unsafe living conditions in some of the buildings, many of them with hundreds of code violations. And that's why I was a, pr a proud co-sponsor of an ordinance that publishes the names of those landlords who refuse to act in, in a manner to make their buildings safer for residents. It should be a thing of the past that affordable housing must be unsafe housing. Income inequality is at an all-time high. It's why I was uh, proud to work with my colleagues to pass the $13 minimum wage, but that's not enough. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the uh, $15 minimum wage ordinance. And currently, I'm serving on a task force to, uh, for, with City Hall to push for mandatory sick leave uh, for our residents, especially uh, those who live from paycheck to paycheck. I'm doing that because it is the right thing to do. Many of you in this room have told me that you are pleased with the incredible and positive changes that you have seen since I have been elected office. But there is still more to do. That's why I'm asking you to join me and support me as we move together to make this ward a safer place and a place where we can do our shopping. Thank you so much. You can, you can applaud, but I warn you, it takes time away from questions. We'll have fewer questions. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Crawford. Thank you all for coming to this debate. Uh, I've lived down the street at Lawrence and Kenmore for nearly a decade. Uh, my partner and I are raising our son here uh, in Uptown because this is home, and we love it here. Uh, but we all know that this neighborhood has some issues. Uh, I want to work full time on addressing these issues uh, in the neighborhood so that we can make it the very best neighborhood in Chicago. I've been successful at some pretty tough institutions, Notre Dame, Procter & Gamble, the University of Chicago Law School, uh, Kirkland and Ellis. I've gained some pretty good uh, credentials and experience in business, finance, and law. Uh, the skills I've gained, negotiating, analyzing law and financial data, uh, advocating, and how to move the ball forward from point A to point B, uh, those are, will serve me well in the ward and on city council. But I've also been investing in this neighborhood, in our city, for years. Before law school, I worked at Christopher House, an early childhood education agency around the corner from here. And I had a very nice homecoming there last week. Uh, I've served on the board of Northside Community Federal Credit Union for six years. Again, it's just a block away. Uh, I've chaired fundraisers for Howard Brown Health Center, and I've represented clients living with mental illness and with disabilities. I've gotten awards for my advocacy on behalf of the LGBT community um, in civil <laughs> rights litigation. And I've become a city leader, having gone through programs like Leadership Greater Chicago, uh, which also calls people like Michelle Obama and Lisa Madigan as alumni. I'm running because in 2011, we had an opportunity to, uh, when Helen Schiller retired, we, we could have had a leader who brought our community together to get big things done, like addressing gang violence in a real way, or uh, getting our entertainment district going, creating great development around the Wilson Red Line stop. 
We could have had a leader who ended this polarization that I think um, Alderman Schiller was uh, somewhat responsible for. But instead of a big picture leader uh, to focus on crime and development, we've had a leader who's focused on priorities like pigeons and pulling up benches at bus stops, pleasing the big developers who have donated more than $100,000 to his campaign. Meanwhile, the violent crime in this neighborhood is getting worse. I don't think anybody can argue with that. And the empty storefronts are growing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you bring in one new business a month when more than one new business leaves. We're not getting the progress we need. It's been a missed opportunity. We need someone stronger and smarter to take us forward. We need somebody who will have greater influence in the city, a stronger negotiator and advocate for this neighborhood. The Tribune, the Sun-Times, and the Fraternal Order of Police agreed that's me. We can make our streets safer. We can make our neighborhoods better, our schools better. But for that, we need leadership. I will bring every ounce of my work ethic, passion, and smarts to the job of uh, making our neighborhood and our city better. I'm asking for your vote so I can get to work to make our community better for all of us. Thank you. Now the candidates will question each other, and we're alternating. So Ms. Crawford will ask Mr. Kappelman the first question, and you have a minute and a half to respond. Alderman, I've learned from the Fraternal Order of Police that after you were forced into a runoff, you asked them to reverse their endorsement of me and instead endorse you. Can you explain why the Fraternal Order of Police has continued to endorse me and to refuse to endorse you? Thank you. One of the things I, I told the police, because I wasn't sure you were upfront with them about this, was that uh, your position on pensions changes depending on who your audience happens to be. Um, what you've said to uh, the IVI IPO and what you've said to the Chicago Sun-Times differs completely. I believe the uh, police uh, should have been aware of that. I, I can say, though, that I'm very proud that I have the endorsement of the uh, uh, Chicago Police Sergeants Association, and I've worked very uh, diligently with them and our commanders. Uh, one police officer told me you didn't even know Commander Fogaris' name. Uh, so I continue to work with that, and I'm very proud of the work that I've done with them. Thank you. Thank you. Now you may ask Ms. Crawford. You sure. have a minute and a half. Uh, each ward receives funds to pay for critical services that pay for repaving of streets and alleys, lighting, and sidewalk repair. In your Chicago Tribune questionnaire, you stated that you would cut ward menu funds that 46 ward residents depend on to improve our community. Please tell the residents what other services you would plan to cut. Well, I think this is another example um, out of many that have happened in your campaign of you taking something that I've said out of context. Uh, you, you know, I've talked about um, different proposals, you know, such as possibly uh, reducing the size of city council. So I don't know whether it's specifically that proposal that you uh, are referring to, but we were asked to address that proposal specifically in the Sun-Times uh, or the Tribune questionnaire. Um, obviously, I'm, I want to advocate for city residents, or for ward residents. I mean, I'm not going to allow uh, the 46th ward to get anything less than any other ward gets. And in fact, I'm running because I think we need to get more. Uh, we need a stronger negotiator at the bargaining table. We need somebody who's going to be fighting to make sure that we get the development we need. Uh, not somebody who's interested in being a yes man for the mayor. Not somebody who's interested in pleasing um, his developer friends. So I'm running, um, again, to be the chief advocate, the, the chief negotiator at the bargaining table for residents of the 46th Ward, and that's exactly what I'll be if I'm elected. Thank you. Now we'll begin with the audience questions. And uh, Mr. Kappelman, you will go first. What do you envision for developing the property at Montrose and Clarendon, the Merrillville site? Thank you. First off, I also want to call Amy out on what she said to the Chicago Tribune. Here's what she said, quote, ward menu funds should be on the table to cut. That's, that's directly from the Chicago Tribune. The uh, Clarendon Montrose is a TIF. It is sitting on tax-exempt property, so right now there are zero tax uh, money in that, uh, on that uh, uh, TIF. 
Uh, the whole purpose of this TIF is to generate needed tax revenue to create uh, and to rehab the Clarendon Park Fieldhouse. Uh, that's what the ward residents want. That's what this, uh, the mayor wants. That's what I want. And I'm on a target to do that. I am already in, there's a new uh, discussion that's now back on the table with the developer uh, and the owner and Department of Planning and myself to do that. And when we're finished, we're going to have a beautiful Clarendon Park Fieldhouse. Thank you. Ms. Crawford? Uh, again, the alderman continues to uh, misrepresent my record, but um, you know you can ask the Chicago Tribune and the Sun Times who endorsed me, and so did the police. Um, with respect to the Clarendon Montrose site, um, you know I, I think it's another example of not enough getting done in this ward. It's continued to sit empty and idle, and it's an eyesore in the community. Um, it's a complex issue because it's a very strange tiff, um, you know. TIFs are supposed to be for spurring economic development, not for fixing parks. Um, you know, we need an alderman, I think, who's going to understand the complexity of these financial, uh, the financial issues and the multiple layers of issues, um, you know, political, uh, financial, et cetera, at that particular site. Um, the current proposal is basically dead where it is now. It's sitting in the Department of Planning. And our alderman hasn't been able to get anything done, even though it was a priority when he started. Um, that's just uh, typical of his approach to development in the ward. He hasn't been able to get things done. And uh, the Department of Planning, you know, people in the city departments that I've talked to have said, he doesn't know how to negotiate. He's not a good hand at the bargaining table for the 46th ward. So uh, obviously I bring a background of advocacy, of, of business savvy, and it's my, you know, obviously I'm going to work as hard as I can so that we can actually get some real progress at that site uh, in my first term as alderman. Thank you. Ms. Crawford, please explain your position on economic development for the 46th Ward. Sure. So I think the alderman needs to focus on a few key areas for economic development. Uh, the Wilson Red Line stop is one. Um, an entertainment district for the ward uh, is the second, and the third is the Maryville site. We talked a little bit about the Maryville site, so I'll talk a little bit about the other two priorities. Uh, the second one, the key to an entertainment district to me, is not just the couple of big venues that we have in the ward, and you know, of course the alderman promised uh, in 2012 that ground would be broken on the Uptown Theater uh, in 2013 and that would be finished by 2015. Of course, that's not the case. But what we really need to do to have a great uh, entertainment or cultural district is to leverage existing businesses uh, and venues, not just the big ones, but also the small ones, uh, and attract new business to make a great entertainment district. Um, you know, we can partner with, be a stronger partner for Uptown United, the small, um, with the Uptown business partners as well. And my vision for the ward is one where, you know, not where somebody walks out, um, you know, not where somebody gets tickets to the Aragon six months ago, but where they walk out of their house on a Friday night and they come to Uptown because number one, they know it's going to be safe and number two, uh, they know that there's going to be something interesting to do. Um, so, you know, my vision for the ward is one where we are, have an alderman who's actively promoting local business. That's why I've been uh, supported by businesses like Crew, Bridgeview Bank, and MDT architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy said previously that for every new business that has come into the ward, another one has left. I challenge Amy to list all uh, this number of businesses that have left because it's just simply not the truth. It's, it's, she's not being truthful here. Um, there have been a lot of plans in place. The problem was those plans that were being discussed were discussed before Amy decided to run for alderman. In uh, August, we had a, a, a planning meeting to discuss the streetscaping, $6 million streetscaping in, uh, by the, in the entertainment district area. We're putting an outdoor plaza. Uh, and as a result of that, we are creating more businesses. We have. Uh, Uptown Underground, uh, it's already been into the uh, area, 42 grams. We have another uh, uh, new business coming in uh, where Annoyance Theater was placed. Uh, so it, it is happening, and, and I'm very proud of the work that we're doing also with the, up, with the uh, Wilson uh, uh, Station. The Wilson Station 
it's, again, it's work done with the Metropolitan Planning Council. Again, Amy wasn't at those meetings because she had not yet announced she was running for alderman. But it was an extensive program that involved many residents, and I was glad to see many of you there. Thank you. Mr. Kappelman, what is the status of Cuneo Hospital? So at this point in time, the uh, developer, Jim Lechinger, uh, by the way, that development was not going to go forward because there was no plan in place to ensure that the Clarendon Park Fieldhouse was done. And, and that's why I insisted if we were going to, if we were going to have this uh, TIF, it had to be done so that we had this uh, Clarendon Park Fieldhouse. We need it for our community. We especially need it for our youth. And I'm not going to move forward until I know a plan is in place to make sure that happens. You deserve it. The youth deserve it. So with the uh, current plan that is in place, we are, I've talked to Jim Lechinger, that piece of property is not going to be needed for his development because he has the needed FAR, floor area ratio, uh, to get his development in place. And so I go back to our 30 member zoning development committee. They will be making their decisions. It's in a group of uh, organizations that are very diverse. Uh, that breaks down a lot of the barriers that we see in this community where they come together and make uh, a plans for upzoning uh, that will ensure that the interests of everyone is protected. Thank you. Ms. Crawford? So again, we've talked about this, um, the Cuneo Hospital site, Clarendon, Montrose, et cetera. Um, nothing has gotten done on it, and we it's not clear whether we're really any closer to the finish line than when the alderman started, because the per current proposal is stalled, um, and nothing's going on. Now, I've met with Jim Lechinger, too. Um, you know, I have a decent sense of what's going on, but I think I have you know, financial wherewithal and legal background to, to bring to bear on this and be a, a more effective advocate to get uh, the ward what we need from this development. Both great development to fix what's been a blight in our ward, but also to fix the field house that, that badly needs repair. And again, uh, simply nothing's been done. But let's talk about uh, the businesses in the area. Uh, you know, uh, as the Tribune noted, the alderman has touted the new Sonic as his greatest economic achievement, another fast food restaurant. I don't think that's moving the ball forward in terms of great business development. Uh, let's talk about Forget Me Not, the business that just announced that it, last week that it would be closing. We're going to be losing the Starbucks on Wilson next year. What about Fresh Harvest Market, Pollo Loco, Kinetic Playground, The Annoyance, Nick's Uptown, um, the 7-Eleven in Buena Park where it basically moved from uh, across the street from one side to the other, um, taking what could have been a great piece of land for uh, development and just moving a convenience store across the street to expand. The spot on Broadway, Fontana Grill, Uptown Pie Company, we could go on, but we all know that the ball hasn't moved forward on economic development under his term. Okay, uh, Ms. Crawford, <clears throat> you are first for the next question. What are your plans for the new Sonic on Wilson? I had to ask what that was. I was told it's a store. Has it exceeded your expectations? What are my plans for it? Yes. Um, I might plan to go get a milkshake. Um, <laughs> I don't know, in the next few weeks. But I don't have any plans for it. Uh, what I've just touched on this. I think, again, a Sonic doesn't really move the needle on economic development that we need. It's you know fast foods and convenience stores growing in our neighborhood. That's not really what we need. Uh, we need to attract more small business to the ward. Um, you know, we don't need another big box store or, or chains. And, you know, we've seen that when there are successful businesses like Baker and Nosh moving in, you know, that's what can really change a community. Um, to attract and keep businesses, we need to get rid of the violent crime in the neighborhood, number one. And number two, we need to go have an alderman who's going to be able to go out and market uptown uh, and bring businesses that will truly upgrade the, the retail here. Um, again, I've talked about my vision of the entertainment district here. Again, one that leverages small uh, venues and not just big ones. We need great economic development here, and people have been talking about it for, uh, for decades. But, you know, the area is definitely ripe for commercial development. I welcome it, and I think as a member of the business community, as an advocate, uh, I'm the right person to bring this here, um, and, and that's my vision for the ward. As far as the Sonic, uh, I, because perhaps Amy doesn't have this background, but when, when uh, 
a business comes into the area, they oftentimes do a, a business plan and a study. They want to know if their business is going to be successful. The reason, the critical piece of why it was important for Sonic to come in, because it gave a message to other businesses, small businesses that cannot afford to do this type of a study. It tells them, wow, if Sonic came here, then this is a place that I too can be successful. And forget me not, what, what Amy forgot to say is that Forget-Me-Not's closing downs because their business was too successful. She says she was overwhelmed. But that also sends a message that other flower shops are going to be welcomed in there. We don't, we don't need just one flower shop. We need more flower shops. We're, we're on the track to get more economic development happening because of the work I did to get this uh, Wilson L station rehabbed. I'm, very proud of the work that we did. And just look out, just talk to the business owners, just talk to the many businesses that, that feel supported by me. They're, they're supporting me because they know I have their backs and their retail sales are going up. Thank you. Thank you, you're next for the next question. Do you believe gentrification is a bad thing for the ward? Yes, I, I, there's, there's gentrification and there's revitalization. Uh, the work that I've done in this ward, I made sure that we did not lose any government affordable subsidized housing. None has been lost. Actually, we have gained more in this ward. The Uptown community has the highest amount of government subsidized housing in the entire city. And under my leadership, I, I wasn't going to allow us to lose any. However, it is not acceptable to have housing be unsafe. You cannot call affordable housing affordable housing if it's also unsafe housing. And that's why I worked really hard to make sure that when housing fell into so much disrepair and had to go through extensive rehabs because it should have been monitored better under the prior administration, that the residents living there found safer housing, more affordable housing, and, and housing that provided them with dignity. Thank you. Uh, I think we should be honest with people. We've lost a lot of uh, affordable market rate housing in this ward, and everybody knows that, um, you know, over the past four years. Now, you know, what I would say is it's important to preserve and where needed improve the affordable housing that we have. I think that the mix of people that we have and the diversity we have in this ward is really special. Nobody is advocating for poorly managed affordable housing, however. Um, you know, not the people living in it, and you know, but... Uh, when you just tear down affordable housing without regard to where people are going, it's just worsening the affordable housing crisis we have in the city. And I think, you know, you've seen more people than ever under the Lawrence and Wilson viaducts this winter um, because so much has been removed. Now, the question was, uh, is gentrification a bad word? I think gentrification is an economic force that uh, continues to happen. And, you know, no one person is going to stop it. We want the neighborhood to continue to develop. It, but you know, but but we need an alderman who's going to be strong enough to strike the right balance, preserving the diversity that we have, uh, working to create new affordable housing in creative ways. Uh, I think in mixed income contexts uh, for working families, for seniors, but not somebody who's got an agenda to eliminate affordable housing in the ward, which is what I think the alderman has done. Thank you. Now you have the next question. Can we guarantee that the Please don't interrupt. Uh, would you like to leave? Can we guarantee that the Wilson Men's Hotel won't be shut down? First off, I want to go on uh, <clears throat> record that um, the reader recently published an article about the Clarendon Montrose TIF, and in that, Amy stated that that site did not need any more affordable housing. So again, she's talking out of two sides of her mouth. Uh, can we uh, guarantee that the uh, Wilson Men's uh, Hotel can stay? Uh, when I first got into office, we had residents in that uh, uh, residence come to us and talk about rats crawling over them, uh, talked about the bed bugs, they talked about the horrible living conditions. And I worked with the current owner, made sure that we uh, cleaned up the area, and we also 
uh, put in a kitchen so they could cook their meals. I also made sure that a room was provided that was air conditioned because at the uh, previously there was no air conditioning in there and they, we had a history of people dying. Uh, th these are rooms with absolutely no windows. Um, I also asked the city to put in a case manager from Inspiration Corporation to provide these men with services so that they could do everything we could to have them live in dignity and as uh, I remain committed to ensuring that we do everything possible to uh, advocate for these men. I haven't stopped and I'll continue doing so. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. No, I can't guarantee that um, I can stop the Wilson Men's Club from closing. I'm not sure any one person can. Um, but what I do think is that we need an advocate to try to preserve the affordable housing that we have here. Uh, I don't think, again, that our alderman has done that. You know, back uh, last summer, I talked to the alderman. I encouraged him to support a moratorium on the redevelopment of SROs. Um, I was concerned about the SRO housing that we were losing so rapidly over the last couple of years. And he said um, that he wouldn't support a moratorium. I mean, I didn't know, you know, necessarily what's the right solution, but just can we pause this to give it more thought, make, not make it an election year football. He said, no, I don't even support a moratorium, because, and I asked him why, and he said, because these conditions are so bad, we need to turn this over as soon as possible. We can't allow these people to, to live this way. And I said, well, uh, he said, you wouldn't want to go to any of these places. And I said, well, I'd love to go. Will you show me? And he said, well, the conditions were so bad before I fixed them that, uh, you know, that's how bad they, they used to be. So, uh, you know, he likes to take a lot of credit for, for fixing issues in the neighborhood, but uh, I think he's presided over... Uh, the elimination of a lot of affordable housing here. I don't think he's going to be somebody who's going to take a creative approach to try to fix issues and make sure that buildings are better managed. I think he would rather see the affordable housing go away. Um, you know, I'm not going to be able to save all affordable housing all the time in the ward, but I will be an advocate so that we try to preserve all of the affordable housing that we have here. Thank you. Now, you are next for the uh, next question. If you could bring one dream project to the ward, what would it be and why? I'd really like to see something like an <clears throat> Apple store at the Wilson Red Line stop. Um, I think something like that could help to change the community. That's the kind of development that we need that could be transformational. Uh, it could be an anchor for great development uh, around that Wilson and Broadway area that has felt unsafe for people for a long time. Um, I've had people come to me who have been working on the Wilson Red Line project uh, for a while, and they have had concerns that we're not getting the kind of development that we need because our alderman hasn't been uh, strong enough to get people to the table to make something happen. Um, you know, we all know that government entities exist in their silos. CTA cares about entrances and exits, um, where the train tracks are, but they don't care about great transformational economic development for the ward. Um, you know, Truman College is the same way, care about educating students. You know, even though 10,000 people are coming mostly by the red line um, stop every day, they don't care about great economic development. Um, we need a strong alderman to get together uh, the folks at Truman, CTA, CDOT, uh, the Target, the Aldi's, and the residents to figure out what we're gonna do and make it happen. Uh, the Urban Land Institute did a study in uh, 2012 uh, and said also, in order to make transformational development happen, you need to cut the violent crime in this area uh, before anybody will move in here. That hasn't happened and that's what needs to happen in order to get what we need at the Wilson Red Line stop. Okay. Uh, thank you. Actually. Uh, the Metropolitan Planning Council we met in late spring and we talked specifically about what we wanted to see happen at the Wilson L station. Again, it, you know, Amy decided to run for alderman in October so she didn't attend any of those public meetings. Had she attended those public meetings she would have also heard that at the Gerber building where she wants Apple uh, to come in, the community said they wanted an indoor farmers market. It's also what the Uptown Chamber of Commerce uh, wanted as well, Uptown United. Uh, what, what I want to see happen is to build on that. We're building, we, there, I want to see this indoor farmers market to become something like you've seen in Seattle, the Pikes Market, that, that entertainment piece to complement what I want to do on the, on the uh, uh, entertainment district. I have created the bones to make this entertainment district in place. Although the 
uh, Uptown Theater is just recently part of the 46th Ward. I've, I've met with the mayors and the Department of Planning to do a, an economic analysis to have a return on investment of the Uptown Theater, and we're hoping to release those plans um, uh, very soon. Uh, but it's a large undertaking, and the work that I've done as alderman so far has made that happen. Thank you. Now we'll go away from development questions. And Mr. Kappelman, you are, will be first to answer this. What are your plans to provide long-range assistance for the large number of homeless individuals who reside under the viaduct on Lawrence? Great question. Um, I have a master's in social work, uh, specialized in mental health and alcohol and drug dependence. I have founded a homeless shelter. What we have found is that under the 2.0 plan, which uh, asks for more coordination, the city has, we work in silos. Uh, so we have uh, 10 different programs that are providing services to 15 individuals. I've asked the city to create a mapping of where we have homeless services and where we do not, so we don't have people falling through the cracks, and also asking for more coordination uh, of that. So with that, in my newsletter that we released two weeks ago, we have a uh, $150,000 grant to Thresholds. Thresholds will have a team, a small team of people that will interact with those uh, people that are living under the viaduct to give them uh, a safe place to live. The other part is that we need harm reduction shelters because that's another reason why people are, especially under the viaduct, Department of Family Support Services are saying too many of them have drug, alcohol and drug dependence. We need to create safe housing with wraparound services for people, harm reduction housing, both shelters and uh, places of residence. That's the way to advocate for them. Thank you. So I agree that we do need to create safe housing and wraparound services for folks uh, living under the viaducts. That certainly uh, hasn't happened over the last four years. Um, you know, if you look at the Sun-Times and the Tribune's endorsement of me, you know, the Tribune said um, that Alderman Kappelman believes the key to helping the homeless is to coordinate services that get them back on their feet, but, and he's right. I agree. Uh, but two years ago, he ordered the Salvation Army to stop feeding people out of a soup truck. That's the answer? Uh, and that's why, you know, one of the reasons why they endorse me. Uh, sometimes he has a vision for a better life for the marginal folks in his ward, but he has failed on several occasions to tr treat them right in the short term. Uh, and they endorsed me. So I think if you look at the reduction of uh, sort of last chance affordable housing in this ward, again, there's no surprise that we see more people under the viaducts. And I think, uh, you know, new policies have been created by the city in terms of how to uh, notify the homeless that their things will be moved for street cleanings and things like that uh, because of how the alderman has uh, tried to get the police to, uh, you know, basically move, move their stuff around, throw it out, etc. So I think people need to be treated decently. I think the alderman has, uh, you know, rhetorically the right approach in terms of creating safe housing and wraparound services, but I think if you look at his actions, uh, he has not done well by the homeless, or frankly, the, the residents who would like to see that problem addressed. Thank you. Now, you, Ms. Crawford, you are first for the next question, and this person is addressing it specifically to you, but both candidates will answer it. Do you think there should be more affordable housing, or do we have enough? So I know that uh, the alderman has accused me of changing my position on this. It's, you know, I, I haven't. What I have said repeatedly is that I think we've got roughly the right mix of affordable housing in the ward right now. We have lost quite a bit over the last four years. I'm interested in seeing if we can add, you know, units here and there in responsible ways uh, through mixed income developments for working families and for seniors. Um, I have acknowledged that we have quite a few homeless shelters in the ward. We've got a number of facilities for folks living with mental illness. And I think it's entirely consistent with my position on affordable housing to say that residents are not prepared to have, uh, you know, uh, more homeless shelters in the ward. They're not prepared to have more facilities um, for folks living with mental illness. We need to basically strike the right balance. We're always going to be losing affordable housing, so replacing it in responsible ways is appropriate. Uh, I'm not looking to go down the road of our political past. I'm looking to take us into a future uh, that's balanced. Thank you. Mr. Kappelman. Again, if you look at uh, this 
this uh, week's reader, Amy has gone on record saying that uh, we do not need any more affordable housing. I believe we do. That's why I was proud to serve on the Affordable Requirements Ordinance Task Force. That task force lays out incentives uh, to create more affordable housing in this city. I believe this city is in a crisis because of the lack of affordable housing. And when I worked on this task force, I specifically wanted a requirement that all developments that are, that are given incentives must put some amount of affordable housing because we desperately need it and um, uh, we were successful at that. Uh, the city has, has still a long ways to go and I will continue to push for more affordable housing, but it must be safe. Thank you. Thank you. You're first for the next question. What can be done to increase the budget for the Wilson L stop? Well, it, it started out as a $25 million promise back in, uh, I believe, 2003. It's now a $203 million makeover. Um, the complaints I'm hearing right now from residents is that if there's anything, it's, it's too much. I don't think it is because of the massive overhaul that is needed. It's also laying the groundwork to create more economic development. As the Metropolitan Planning Council has has uh, shown when, when we as a public met together to discuss what we needed to do to encourage that happening when the, as the Wilson Yard, uh, the, the Wilson L is getting rehabbed. Thank you. So uh, just back on the last question, I don't think anybody who lives in affordable housing in this ward uh, believes that the alderman is the one who's going to be protecting their affordable housing. I think you know they understand that the alderman has tried to eliminate affordable housing in an active way. We haven't created more affordable housing in the ward. So, uh, And again, I, I think my approach is the right balance. And, and the difference between us, as it is with so many issues, is that I'm pretty honest about what I think the right approach is. You know, I don't say one thing and do another. I'm pretty honest about what I think is the right balance. Um, with respect to the Wilson Red Line stop, um, you know, it, it's obviously a huge investment. And again, my concern is that we use the, the dollars that have been allocated to it wisely and that we get transformational development. Uh, again, uh, we know that we're not going to get great development there that's going to change the neighborhood unless we are able to uh, address the violent crime issues in the neighborhood. Uh, unless we're able to develop the ancillary neighborhood, uh, attracting more businesses to fill these empty storefronts. There are aldermen who pound the pavement, uh, attracting new businesses in the ward. I mean, Harry Osterman is one, uh, Tom Tunney is another, but we don't have that here. So again, filling the empty storefronts and addressing the violent crime issue, uh, that's what's needed to make this investment uh, truly something special for, uh, for the neighborhood. Thank you. And you are first for the next question. What have each of you done personally over the past four years to help us have safer streets? Well, I would point to um, you know my training as a lawyer, and you know specifically, uh, you know I've worked on uh, for a federal judge uh, where I was writing opinions on issues of criminal law uh, in an area. I was in Hammond, Indiana, where I wrote opinions uh, about. Uh, oftentimes dealing with drug, uh, gun, and gang issues. So I have experience dealing with uh, legal issues in this area. Specifically in the neighborhood, I've spent a lot of time over the last few uh, months and year talking with residents about their safety concerns. Uh, people here do not feel safer than they did four years ago. We've had more murders over the past four years than we have in the prior four. Uh, we know that shootings and murders are up more than 40%. Uh, murders are way up from 2013 to 2014. People don't feel safer in the neighborhood, and that's why I have supporters like uh, my uh, new friend Robin on Magnolia, who had a gun fired from uh, the ground next door to her house into her son's bedroom window and a bullet lodged above his crib. Um, that kind of stuff makes people feel very scared and unsafe. We need to try to keep the residents that we have here, you know, and staying here. And unless we can ensure people's basic safety, um, you know, that's not going to happen. So, uh, the audience can figure that out for themselves or not. Uh 
First off, I want to say that in the 10 years Amy's lived here, she never once attended a CAPS meeting until October when she decided to run for office. Uh, since 2009, I've been doing positive loitering, much of it in front of her home, to address the gang and drug use going in in front of her home. She never once was there. I know that because my husband is a CAPS beat facilitator. Um, I can say, though, that if you look back 10 years, we had five gangs that were selling drugs commonplace, and we would regularly see uh, massive fighting in the streets. To say that we've come a long ways is, is a complete understatement. I created task forces, targeted task forces, working with many different groups to address crime, and we know it's been successful. One of those task forces was at Sheridan and Lawrence, and residents are telling me it's much safer. The businesses are telling me that retail has gone up 20%. On top of that, we are getting more police assigned to the 19th district, and I successfully advocated to get more B cops walking the streets, getting to know who you are, getting to know the businesses. The shootings that we did take place uh, occurred because there was a drug bust, and there were 17 arrests, so there was unrest. The gangs know that I am working to uh, get them out of existence, and that is happening. Thank you. You've... Are you done speaking? Yes. We've seen six, uh, Mr. Kappelman, you're first to answer this. We've seen six city mental health sites close while you've been in office. How will you advocate for people who are experiencing struggles with their mental health? Uh, when I, I came in office, there were 12 mental health centers and 132 not-for-profit mental health centers. When uh, it was consolidated and all 50 aldermen uh, voted for this, we made it so that uh, we were able to provide more services. The fact of the matter is with, with the limited amount of mental health services that the city has and the 132 not-for-profit mental health centers, we now have made it so that when people come in needing help with no insurance, they come in for the city mental health centers, and then once they are stabilized, we transfer them over uh, to get care at the not-for-profit, the 132 different not-for-profit mental health centers. That opens up more uh, slots for people with no insurance, for the undocumented, to ensure that we get more uh, mental health than ever before. On top of that, I'm working with Sheriff Dart, and we just released a $250,000 grant so that when people are released from Cook County Jail, we make it so that they go into transitional housing with wraparound services. It stops the recidivism, and it also is a less expensive thing to do because when people are living on the streets, especially with mental illness, the cost of Medicaid goes up four times. That is not appropriate. Under my leadership, we're making that change. Thank you. So I think it's wrong that we cut the mental health budget in the city uh, so drastically. And of course, our alderman, although he's a social worker and professes to care so much about this community, uh, voted for that budget. But we can't expect him to do anything different from what the mayor has proposed because he's been with the mayor basically 97% of the time. Um, that's why it's so funny that he accuses me of wanting to raise taxes on uh, of all sorts when he has voted for every tax increase and fee increase that the mayor has proposed over the last four years. And just so you know, on a family, average family of four is paying the equivalent in taxes and fees 60% higher uh, taxes no than what they no did more. four years ago. Uh, so please keep that in mind. I have had many uh, social workers and people concerned about those living with mental illness uh, contribute to my campaign, volunteer for my campaign, because they've been appalled at how uh, the alderman has treated this community. Um, and back to his prior points, you know, obviously the alderman is trying to point, uh, accuse me of being somebody who hasn't been in the community uh, long enough. I've been in this community for uh, a decade. I've been working with and for uh, agencies that do good work in this community. Uh, I have the support of a lot of people in this community. So the notion that I haven't been anywhere, uh, haven't been around long enough or haven't done enough is simply false as well. I've been a leader on citywide issues. You know, I've been a part of groups like Leadership Greater Chicago, the Illinois Women's Institute for Leadership. You know, I'm trying to bring something uh, bigger and stronger, a real vision for this work, which we haven't had in the last four years. 
Thank you, and Ms. Crawford, you are next, first for the next question. What plans do you have for a better police presence in the most dangerous areas of the ward? And I've talked about this a lot on the campaign because I think it's wrong that we've lost uh, a fourth of our police force over the last three years. Uh, the ninth, we used to be in the 23rd district here. Uh, now this has been merged into 19. We used to have 460 police across this ward, um, across what is now the 19th police district. Now we have less than 350. So it's been a huge drop in police. Our alderman stood by when that merger of districts happened. Uh, he hasn't been leading the charge for more police. He hasn't been able to get uh, more police for us. I know he announced that we had two new w beat cops walking on Wilson Avenue. I've talked to the businesses on Wilson Avenue who said that they haven't seen them. Um, we need somebody stronger to advocate for police services uh, in our ward, for more police. And again, this isn't, this isn't about uh, asking for a thousand new cops citywide that we don't know how to pay for. This is about addressing an allocation problem in the 19th district, uh, where we've lost far more than any other police district in this city. Uh, so being a stronger advocate to get more police is important, and specifically working with the commanders in the CAPS program to address the hotspots in this neighborhood. I've talked to many residents at um, Clarendon and Montrose, Clarendon and Agatite, uh, Sheridan Park, where these murders have been, uh, and they don't they see far fewer police than, than we have. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be getting uh, police resources within the district and uh, across the city uh, in places that haven't lost cops uh, to address these hotspots that are, are known. What Amy said about businesses uh, not seeing those beat cops, it's the same story. We have all these businesses in this area that have moved here because they believe this is the place to be. And I know you appreciate it because you like shopping there. Um, with the merger of the two police districts, the 23rd and the 19th, we now have more resources available to respond to those areas with higher need. We are now able to deploy police in a very smart fashion. If Amy had gone to the CAPS office at the police station for beats 23, 24, 25, she would have heard Commander Elias Vulgaris state to everyone attending there that we are on the track to get more police. And we are getting more police. I've also urged the police and the businesses and the residents to call 911 more frequently. Uh, many of the residents in this room have my uh, cell phone and they text me. And when we have more people calling 911, uh, we get more police. And that's how, that's one of the reasons why we are on track to get more police because you residents are willing and you're stepping up to the plate to calling. I've also been very involved every step of the way to having the police working together with many different groups to address crime. Amy wouldn't know that because she's never been a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, and you are first for the next question. Property taxes have to go up. Will you pledge to free city spending and use property tax revenue to reduce the pension shortfall? Amy has gone on record time and time again. If there's one thing consistent, because there's many inconsistency, uh, inconsistencies she stated about the pension crisis and affordable housing and the, and the uh, casinos, but she has been consistent on raising your property taxes. I will not raise your property taxes. I, I believe that uh, we have to put uh, the focus on making sure government is being more efficient. Right now, in the private sector, for every manager, there are 16 employees. In the city of Chicago, for every manager, there are six. There are still a long ways to go. Uh, we still work in many silos. Uh, the uh, mayor's office and many of the different departments, and when it comes to budget time, they see me asking those hard questions to make sure they're operating more efficiently. And I will continue to push for that. Thank you. <laughs> So I think that was a non-answer to the question, and I think that he refuses to, the alderman refuses to um, acknowledge the reality that we're in a severe uh, pension hole here, and we need to take uh, some serious steps if we're going to avoid bankruptcy as a city. Um, you know, the idea that I want to go out and raise your property taxes because I'm just a tax raiser, I mean, that's, 
just a joke. Uh, I'm a property owner. I really would rather not see my property taxes go up. Uh, there's one person here who has raised taxes uh, and fees on you, and that is our current alderman. Um, you know, the fact is we've got a strong mayor uh, in this city. And the idea that one alderman is going to come to the table with some, um, you know, proposal and dictate what's going to happen, I mean, that's not realistic either. Um, but we have an alderman currently who's never going to be an independent voice in city council, is never going to say we should do things this way or that way. I'll be an active part of uh, helping the mayor uh, figure out, you know, form the city budget. And the reason that I've talked about various taxes is because I want to mitigate the harm of a property tax increase on people. Uh, I think everybody in city council uh, understands that there's got to be a, a revenue aspect to this, uh, to fixing this crisis. I do believe that we need to uh, freeze and, and hold expenditures, uh, but also we need, you know, some uh, something to happen on the pension front. It's hard because of the legal, uh, the legal situation that we're in. Um, but we also need revenue. And so, you know, the question is, do you want somebody that's going to tell you the truth or not? Thank you. And Ms. Crawford, you are first. On, this will be the last question. I thank all of the audience for all of your questions. I have a lot more that we haven't gotten to. Uh, what is your position on casinos in Chicago? Yeah, I changed my position on this, and this is the one area where the alderman has correctly identified me as having an inconsistent position. There's really nothing else where I think I've changed positions. So, uh, you know, I, but what I said in both questionnaires where I talked about casino gambling was essentially the same. Um, I think that casino gambling is harmful for people, especially people on the lower end of the economic spectrum. And I've known people uh, over the years have been touched by gambling addictions. And Excuse me, but someone's taking pictures that's not allowed? Please don't, uh, don't, Just got count, the don't count DNA that info torn her reporter time. in trouble. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I, I think casino gambling, you know, obviously it's not the greatest way to uh, raise revenue. So um, I have some misgivings about it. But frankly, you know, people are going to casinos. They're going to casinos in other communities, uh, you know, in the Chicagoland area and Northwest Indiana. In the meantime, we're losing out on revenue as a result of that. So what I said, you know, changed my position, I think responsibly in response to information and consideration, which is what people should do. Uh, you know, I've said that a single casino license, I think, is, is appropriate as long as it's well managed and, and administered. Thank you. You've heard over and over and over again that, that um, Amy's positions change from depending on who her audience happens to be, depending on what questionnaire uh, you happen to read. Uh, I've been consistent. I uh, worked with the mayor on this, and uh, I support the idea of having gambling casinos. I do not like gambling casinos. I don't buy lottery tickets. Uh, but I do know that we have a looming pension crisis, and when uh, I've worked with my colleagues for the part, uh, I'm part of the Paul Douglas Alliance and also working with the mayor's office to make tough decisions. I want the, all the income that comes from this gambling casino to help deal with our pension crisis. I want to do it in a manner that's not raising your property taxes. I am consistent about that. I do not want your property taxes. Um, most of you don't have, you can't afford that. Uh, Amy donated $85,000 to her own personal campaign. Many of you don't earn that in, in a year. Some of you in three or four years. Uh, that's not being respectful of you. So I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to fight for you to make sure uh, we make this a better city and we do it in a way that's fiscally responsible. Thank you. Thank you. Now we turn to closing statements. and. Um Ms. Crawford will go first. You have two minutes. Look, I live here. Uh, we're raising our son here. We want our neighborhoods to thrive, but we can do better. We're blessed to live in a ward that's close to the lakefront and public transportation. Uh, we've got the bones of a great entertainment district and incredible diversity, but we can do better. We see that Andersonville is thriving. Um, further down in Lakeview, it's thriving, but we're not. We're plagued with gangs that make people feel unsafe in the middle of the day. We have empty storefronts, even as we have residents who want to be able to shop here but can't because we have empty storefronts. We can do better. Our current alderman is a nice person. He's got good intentions. But unfortunately, good intentions aren't enough 
to address our serious problems or help residents get basic city services that they need. And I want you to feel the urgency here. We don't have time for four more years of the same lack of progress. The Wilson L stop is gonna get built, but are we gonna get transformational economic development around it or are we just gonna get a new station? Um, that's what's at stake in this election. Bullets are flying around in our neighborhoods. We can't wait to address this terrible violence that's claiming the lives of young people living in this community and making families feel unsafe. Our families can't take four more years of a lack of leadership in this ward. Uh, I'm asking you to see through the alderman's mudslinging and smear campaign. If, if he had a real affirmative record to run on, he wouldn't need to manufacture what amount to lies about me and, and my experience and my record. Are we ready for something different? Aren't we ready for people who are gonna tell us the truth about what we need? Um, aren't we ready for a more powerful and positive vision for the 46th Ward and more independent voices in city council? It's time for us to turn the page on the divisiveness that has plagued us in the past. We need ideas and strong creative leadership to follow through on those ideas. I will lead the charge to help the 46th Ward maintain its identity but become its best self. But I need your vote on April 7th to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kappelman. Thank you. Look how far we've come in these past four years. Just step outside. It's obvious. And it's especially obvious given the serious and deep-seated issues that this ward experienced for the past two decades. The progress we're making is clearly evident. My plans for economic development, they're working. Our targeted task forces to address criminal activity in, in this uh, area has brought, up, out, brought about a, a profound decrease in the number of gangs in this area. After the merger of two police districts, I was able to get more B cops into the area and we are on track for hiring more police. This is happening because from the very beginning, I had a very clear plan in place based on my many years of experience before I ever ran for public office. I've been endorsed by all our elected leaders because I have a history of working well with them and I've established very clear plans to get the job done. Amy's positions on housing, the pension crisis, and the gambling casinos change depending on who her audience happens to be. On the rare occasion that she does offer a plan, it's based on what I am already doing. But she wouldn't know that because she's never been involved in the ward until she made her announcement. The only consistent thing that we have heard is her willingness to raise your property taxes. And while she proclaims to be an advocate for families, Kirkland and Ellis used her to stop working families from getting their earned overtime pay. That's not being an advocate for working families, that's being an advocate for corporate America. I have a plan in place, it's working, but there's still more to do to make this world safer and to create more jobs, and I ask you to join with me as we work together to make this ward a better place for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, and that concludes our forum. Thank you so much to the League of Women Voters and to the People's Church.